What's going on? Alex here, and today I'm answering your questions from the YouTube comments. That's right. You leave questions, I answer them in a video. It's a beautiful thing. And today's question has to do with tax loopholes for the wealthy. Let's take a look. So this question comes from Battles of Olympus. Thank you so much for your question. I appreciate it. And it reads as follows. I watched your video on Saturday about Biden's tax plan. We all heard Trump say, I don't pay taxes because I'm smart. And he went on saying that there are loopholes in the tax code. Is it true that millionaires don't pay taxes because they can afford the best CPAs in the country while the middle class always pays their fair share or most of the country's taxes? You smile just like a tax person. Looks good on you. And thanks for making this video. I'm not sure what smiling like a tax person means, but if it looks good on me, then I appreciate it. Thank you so much for the compliment. Now, let's address your questions. The long and short of it is that, yes, there are tax treatments that are used by the wealthy to reduce the amount of taxes that they pay. That's both income taxes, estate taxes, and so forth. But that's not to say that individuals who are not wealthy or middle class people don't have access to those same tools. The difference is that wealthy people have more to work with in terms of the fees that they can afford to pay for qualified attorneys and CPAs to sit down and really analyze their situation and implement some of the more complex income and estate mitigation tools that are out there and put them in place, right? So it's really a matter of being able to pay for the service and the expertise that you get from a qualified attorney or CPA to put these plans together for you. That's where the issue comes in. And individuals who are middle class or they aren't wealthy at all, in many cases don't have the resources, unfortunately, to put in place some of these tools. On top of that, it's also that there are some exceptions that are applicable, for example, from the estate tax, that if you don't have $11.58 million in your estate, you're not subject to state taxes anyway. So in that case, someone with $400 million can definitely benefit from some estate planning because they would be subject to the estate tax in many cases. So it's really about having the ammunition, so to speak, or having the tools, the funds available to implement these more complex esoteric tax strategies, some of which I'm going to touch on in this video to show you what the wealthy do to mitigate their tax liability. So with that, I want to direct your attention to this document I came across while researching this video, and it's called The Alphabet Soup of Planning and Trust Acronyms and Service Marks. And this was put out by the American Bankers Association. And essentially, these are some of the tools that are used by wealthy individuals to mitigate their estate and income tax liability. So let's take a look at what some of these are. And it's kind of amusing that they use the term alphabet soup, because that's really what it comes down to. If you look at this list here, you see uh, Bing, CLT, CLAT, CLUT, CRT, all these different acronyms, and they are referring to different tax planning strategies, whether it's in place to mitigate income taxes, estate taxes, or both. These are tools that are available that may be used by people that are in poverty or people that are wealthy, both. But Wealthy people generally benefit more from this from an overall dollar perspective, and they have the funds available to put these structures in place. Some of this is not cheap to make happen. This is very complex stuff. We're going to go over it in just a 30,000-foot view. We're not going to get overly technical, but let's see what it says here. In advising clients and customers about different estate planning techniques for making lifetime transfers, trust professionals often encounter a dizzying array of acronyms that are used to describe different techniques. Some of the more common acronyms that a trust professional will encounter are as follows. So this, in many cases, has to do with estate and trust planning, something that you'd put in place with an estate attorney and or a CPA working together. Most of the time would allow these structures to come together. A lot of these structures that we're going to touch on have to do with charitable contributions and getting a deduction for those charitable contributions, trying to maximize that. And trying to reduce the amount of the estate subject to the estate tax. So those are the main drivers that we're going to see here. Those are going to be some common themes. So we have a CLUT, a CRT, a CRAT, a CRUD, and it gets kind of 
amusing at some point when you see how many of these exist. There's a ding. There's a family limited partnership. Let's take a look at this one. So this is a type of limited partnership used to consolidate the management of the assets of a family and take advantage of any applicable valuation discounts in passing property to junior family members. So the goal here is to mitigate the gift taxes and also estate taxes that are applicable in a situation where there is a business that is structured as a partnership and it's closely held, meaning it's held by the members of a particular family. So in that case, a family limited partnership arrangement may be beneficial in reducing estate taxes and gift tax implications as well. So that's the family limited partnership. We also have a GRAT, which is a grantor retained annuity trust. Let's take a quick read of this one. A trust in which the grantor retains the right to a set annual dollar amount for a fixed term and gives the principal to others, such as the grantor's children, at the end of the term. If the grantor survives until the end of the annuity term, all of the trust principal will be excluded from the grantor's estate for death tax purposes. Again, we're excluding assets from the estate. We want to reduce the amount of assets subject to the estate tax. Furthermore, we'll see that a grut is a grantor retained unit trust and skipping the technical aspects we'll just look at this last part if the grantor survives until the end of the unit trust term all the trust principal will be excluded from the grantor's estate for death tax purposes or estate tax it's kind of the same they're synonymous there furthermore and some of these get kind of exotic sounding but this is an intentionally defective grantor trust idgt so this is an irrevocable trust so on and so forth. What the goal is here is to allow the grantor to sell property to the trust and engage in other property transactions without having the transactions treated as sale causing capital gain. Again, we're trying to reduce income taxes on these sorts of transfers and also estate taxes as well. So that's another tool that may be put in place. Furthermore, we have the irrevocable life insurance trust or the ILIT. And this is a trust designed to own life insurance on the life of the insured. And Again, this is a tool by which you can get assets out of your estate. So essentially, beneficiaries can receive a million-dollar life insurance policy that's not subject to estate taxes, whereas if those million dollars were included in your estate, they would, in many cases, be subject to the estate tax, which is 40%, let's not forget. It's pretty significant. So an islet is yet another tool that may be used to get assets out of one's estate. Very useful, very powerful in many cases. We have a aptly named QPERT, Qualified Personal Residence Trust. This is a form of grantor retained income trust in which the grantor transfers a personal residence to an irrevocable trust, which the grantor has the right to reside in and use the property and receive whatever income it produces for a specified term, gives the remainder interest to others, such as the grantor's children. If the grantor survives the term, the principal will be excluded, again, from the grantor's estate for death tax purposes. That's going to be the common theme here. So you have all these different structures available, whole ton of acronyms to learn, and each one of these can be complex in putting together in and of itself. There are a lot of technicalities. There's a lot of different details that you need to be mindful of. Also keeping in mind the long-term implications, short-term implications, and making sure that you don't set off an implication from an income tax perspective or a gift tax perspective that you didn't intend to. Long story short is a lot of this requires some very high-end expertise on the estate planning side, on the tax side. And if there's a family with, let's say, multiple businesses and the businesses have certain structures and that there's a main holding corporation, then there's a bunch of partnerships, there's S corporations, real estate holdings, all of this stuff. This can get extremely complex in terms of trying to minimize estate taxes, but affect what the client wants to achieve. And that if they want to transfer their assets to their children and minimize the estate tax, that's an implication. Or if there's grandchildren involved as well, and there's multiple layers to this stuff can get extremely complex time consuming. And at the end of the day, even if you go through this process, the tax laws are always changing. So you want to make sure that the details of your estate plan hold through any subsequent changes to the tax laws that may be applicable. So a lot of expertise, a lot of knowledge goes into this area, but at the end of the day, the benefit could be millions upon millions of dollars in tax savings, possibly more than that, depending on the size of the estate and the assets you're dealing with. 
And to be very clear, all of these are legal implementations. They're not so much gray area or loopholes, things like that. They are a matter of using the available rules in such a way that accomplishes the client's goals without stepping into the area of illegality or anything that you wouldn't want anybody to know. This is fully above board implementation of tax strategies that can be beneficial. But you ask yourself, you know, in, in terms of putting some of these together, you may pay $20,000 overall for a complex plan. But what I'm trying to illustrate is that there are certainly tools available for wealthy individuals that are typically not used by the middle class because the dollar value isn't there to justify the benefit. The exemptions and exceptions from the estate tax and so forth are significant enough where many estates are not even going to be subject to the estate tax in the first place. That may change in the future. Right now, it's 11.58 million. That could very well be changed to 300,000 or zero, depending on what the next administration does. We don't know. So again, these things are always fluid, but for the most part, these tools are available. They're used by the wealthy, not used very often by the middle class. And those are the reasons, really. It's not that these tools are not available. It's that sometimes they're just not affordable or the overall benefit is not significant enough to justify going through all of this hassle to get this put together. But these tools do exist. Furthermore, I did want to touch on a different story here that highlights the necessity and the benefit of asset protection. And we're going to take a little bit of a detour, but we're going to talk about the wrapper 50 cent. Now you might be thinking, why are we talking about 50 cent right now? That's because we see here that top wrapper 50 cent may lose mansion as bankruptcy bid misfires. And essentially the story is that 50 cent has amassed 500 million from movies, from the music that he's done, sponsorships, all this other stuff. But he's declared bankruptcy. And the bankruptcy happened shortly after 50 Cent was made to pay $5 million to a woman who appears in a sex tape that he released and so forth. There was a whole big thing. But once that lawsuit came out, essentially the judgment was that he had to pay $5 million. Pretty much the next day, he goes bankrupt. Now you're thinking somebody who's earned 150 million or 500 million, whatever the number is, all of a sudden they're sued for 5 million and they go bankrupt. How does that work? All right. So looking at this article, we don't have to read the whole thing, but this is a section I want to highlight. Whether 50 cents career earnings ultimately added up to 150 million, 500 million, or somewhere in between, it's unlikely that much of it simply vanished in less than a decade, right? He's declaring bankruptcy. Let's not forget. As he bragged himself after the first lawsuit went against him, his assets are covered, probably sunk into shell corporations or informal asset protection trusts. Okay, so now we're not talking about mitigating income taxes. We're not talking about mitigating estate taxes or gift taxes. Now we're talking about asset protection that, again, wealthy people can benefit from a lot more than the middle class because wealthy people have more typically in assets to protect and more to lose in that regard. And I'm not trying to throw shade on middle class. I love middle class, wealthy. I love everybody in between. But it's just the fact of the matter that it's more likely that somebody with a $100 million estate has more assets to protect than somebody with a $1 million estate, right? So that's a very important sentence over here. His assets are covered, probably sunk into shell corporations or informal asset protection trusts. In many cases, all of this is fully legal. It's above board. And when you reach a certain level of income, certain level of assets, this starts to make that much more sense to put together, to go through the cost, to go through the consultation with attorneys and tax accounts and so forth and make this work. Because when things hit the fan, you're covered in many cases. This is not legal advice. I'm not an attorney, but I'm just saying that it seems to have benefited 50 cent, at least in this situation. Every dollar that moved out of his personal oversight becomes harder for the courts to claw back. After all, his attorneys can argue that he truly doesn't have that money, so he can't pay. Filing the bankruptcy paperwork only perpetuates the narrative. Meanwhile, of course, the real wealth is safe elsewhere. 
Okay, so if you have $100 million, it may be prudent to do some homework and say, hey, how can I protect this in case something happens? Maybe somebody trips and falls on my rental property. Maybe uh, the widget that I sell causes someone to have a skin reaction. There could be a whole number of pitfalls and lawsuits and other issues that arise. And the question is, when that does happen, how protected are you? And that has to do with this asset protection industry, basically. But you could see that it seems to have benefited 50 Cent. And I believe there was a video that he released where he basically made the case that, hey, I'm not wealthy. My company is wealthy, right? So it's another way of structuring assets in such a way that you can avoid some of the downsides associated with lawsuits and all these other things that may affect either yourself or your business and planning accordingly. So it's a matter of weighing the possible downsides, possible risks, and seeing whether it makes sense to pay X, Y, or Z to protect those assets. All right. Wealthy people in many cases engage in this and it's perfectly legal, perfectly legitimate. Middle class people can also engage in this stuff, but often the costs are so high that they just don't bother. All right. Because paying 20,000 to protect a hundred thousand, many cases just not worth it. All right. And Battles of Olympus, I hope this pretty much sums it up. At the end of the day, yes, in many cases, wealthy individuals are more likely to use asset protection strategies, estate tax mitigation strategies, income tax mitigation strategies, and all those other acronyms that I outlined to minimize the amount of taxes that they pay. Some of them don't, but I would say a wealthier person is much more likely to take advantage of these opportunities because of the serious costs involved in many cases. We're talking about thousands upon thousands of dollars to implement some of the even more basic strategies. All right. Hopefully that helps. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to leave a comment down below, like the video, subscribe to the channel and all that other YouTube good stuff. Hopefully this was helpful. Thanks for watching.